So John Cage once told a story about sitting in a restaurant with the painter Willem de Kooning uh, and they were arguing about the nature of art. And at one point de Kooning makes his fingers into a rectangle shape and he says, if I put a frame ar around some breadcrumbs on a table, that doesn't make the breadcrumbs art. The breadcrumbs are just breadcrumbs with a frame around them, right? They're not, they're not art just because you put a frame around them. And Cage disagreed. Cage thought, uh, no, if you, if you put a frame around the breadcrumbs, that really is all it takes to make something art, right? Like all it takes to make something art is to put a kind of frame around it. Um, so, okay, how do, you, how do we get here? Well, I mean, the point is, is that, um, you know, people have come up with lots of different theories about what exactly art is. Uh, so we might think that art is a matter of representing things. You know, art is about representation uh, or representing things in a certain way. But then, you know, there's plenty of abstract art that's non-representational. Or maybe art is a matter of emotional expression. Uh, but of course, there's plenty of artworks that uh, remove, you know, that kind of remove the uh, the emotions of the artist. John Cage's work is a very good example of that. Uh, like, you know, he, he had lots of techniques to remove his own emotional input. Um, you know, maybe art is a matter of um, exhibiting particular formal properties, or maybe uh, art is uh, something that is produced within particular institutions, or something that exists within a particular historical narrative. I mean, there's lots of ways of thinking about art. Uh, I suppose one of the first questions that arises when we think about art philosophically is, well, yeah, what exactly is art? And then we try to come up with some definition that allows us to distinguish art from non-art. Um, maybe not a strict definition, but, you know, we want some, you know, vague conditions that allow us to classify things as either art or non-art. So we try to find some set of properties that an object has that make it art. Now, if you look at the development of art over the 18 and 1900s, what you find is basically all of these definitions, all of these theories of art just obviously fail. Um, so, you know, somebody will present a theory about what art is, or they'll say, you know, art is X, right? Art is some, like, property X. But then we find, however you try to fill out the X, there are going to be artists who present non-X objects as art, and there seems to be no reason to insist that they are unsuccessful in that respect, at least, at least, you know, with respect to creating art, right? They, they have successfully presented something as art. I mean, you know, uh, take something like Duchamp's fountain, right? So Marcel Duchamp just picked up a urinal, put it on a plinth, and that was it, <laughs> right? Uh, it's literally just a urinal, uh, upside down, turned upside down, stuck it on a plinth. There you go, that's art, right? Um, obviously, uh, when Duchamp did this, it was completely in, you know, violation of uh, the sort of norms of art that existed at the time, but um, it has since become one of the uh, paradigmatic art objects of the 20th century, right? So, you know, you find over the last few hundred years that any attempt to impose a kind of limitation on what can be art uh, just fails, because what happens is as soon as artists realise that somebody's tried to impose that limitation, they just present something outside of those limits and say, this is art, and the artist's always win. Um, you know, the people who are trying to impose the limits, uh, they lose, right? Because the artists present something as art outside of those limits and the artists win. It gets accepted as art. Um, so, uh, you know, as a result of this, the conclusion you get is, well, it kind of seems like basically anything can be art. Um, and so maybe, you know, may so maybe then art like whether or not something is art is a matter of how we choose to interact with it, how we interpret it. Art is in the be in the eye of the beholder, as it were. And so this motivates the kind of view that Cage had, this framing sort of view. Um, anything can be art. Art doesn't have to have a partic any particular style. It doesn't have to be made with any particular intent. It doesn't have to be associated with any particular institution. Breadcrumbs on a table, right? You're just sitting down, eating food, you make some breadcrumbs, those breadcrumbs can be art. It's just a matter of you deciding to put a 
frame around it. And I suppose if we were to put this in, you know, in a slightly more formal way, we might say that uh, according to the framing view, X is art for a subject S, just in case S frames X as art, just in case S puts a little frame around it. That's it. It becomes art. Um, now, I don't think that this view works. I don't think it's convincing at all. Um, I'm going to suggest that there are two options. Uh, you can either adopt a more traditionalist, restrictive view uh, that, that significantly restricts the scope of art, where you're, you're not saying that just anything can be art, or, uh, and this is the view I prefer, uh, or you can adopt the view that there really just is no such thing as art, that the term art is uh, empty. Um, so on, on this view, the emptiness view, art, you know, art seems to be this term that draws distinctions, right? Like it seems to be a term of classification. Uh, so we have these things that are art and things that are not art. That's, it seems like that's what that term is doing. I would suggest it doesn't do that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, so I should say this really, uh, this video is directed towards people who find the framing view attractive. Um, uh, so this is a challenge to them. Um, you can either go more traditionalist or you can join me in saying that really there just is no such thing as art. Um, okay, so I would say that the motivation for the, the frame view, the framing view, is pretty convincing. Um, like this point that uh, any attempt to impose limits on art can just be immediately violated successfully. Uh, that's That seems right to me. Um, I'm really into lots of experimental art, Dadaistic art, avant-garde stuff, you know, so I, I love all that stuff. Um, but I think this framing view runs into some pretty serious problems. So, <clears throat> first of all, the, the frame obviously doesn't have to be a physical object. Um, it's enough to place a kind of mental frame around something. Um, like, this is the idea, right? So, when we look at the breadcrumbs, you don't have to actually build a frame, you know, made out of wood or something. You can just look at the breadcrumbs, and then you do something inside your mind, right? Your mind places the frame around them. And then when you do that, when you, you choose to sort of put this mental frame around them, that makes them art to you. Um, and then maybe you can tell other people that they're art and encourage other people to put a mental frame around them and then they become art for other people as well. Um, so the question is, what exactly is the content of this mental frame? Like what exactly are you doing when you put this mental frame around something? Um, now notice that it's not going to be good enough to say that the mental frame involves just thinking the proposition this is art. Um, because obviously without some prior analysis of what counts as art, that would leave the concept art just completely empty, right? So, so we'd be saying, well, art is whatever is mentally framed as art. Uh, and to mentally frame something as art is to think that thing is art. Uh, <laughs> Like, okay, what's what's the content of that thought exactly? I mean, clearly we'd have to, first of all, know what art is. We'd have to have some prior definition of what art is uh, for that to make sense. So we, we can't just say that the mental frame is just thinking that something is art. Okay, so maybe we can try some more substantive definition, right? Like, um, you might say, oh, well, to mentally frame something as art is to focus on particular properties of that thing, or it's to interact with that thing in a particular way. So maybe, you know, mentally framing something as art involves uh, dispassionately evaluating that thing's aesthetic properties. Uh, you know, like, <clears throat> maybe it's, okay, <laughs> there's going to be some particular set of special aesthetic properties, you know, maybe it's the sort of visual appearance or the formal structure or whatever, and, you know, you can you can just sort of dispassionately evaluate something aesthetically. So when I look at the breadcrumbs, you know, instead of, so instead of looking at this as, you know, a table that I'm eating from, I can just say, okay, this table, this surface of the table has particular qualities, and the breadcrumbs on the table have particular qualities. And once I start doing that, that's what it is to mentally frame something as art. Um, the problem with this move uh, is, 
Well, there's plenty of artworks that are going to be that are going to be non-aesthetic that we we appreciate for properties other than their aesthetic properties. Unless, of course, we're just defining aesthetic properties so broadly that it it, it just doesn't rule out anything. Um, yeah. uh, in which case, we'd be back back to my view that art is empty. Um, you know, there's plenty of artworks where really the point of them is to push some sort of um, political agenda, say. You know, you're not supposed to sort of sit back and just dispassionately uh, dispassionately evaluate their formal properties. No, it's supposed to fire you up. They're supposed, you know, they're making, they're trying to achieve some sort of practical end. Um, you know, or, or maybe you're supposed to engage in like cognitive interpretation of them um, instead of just appreciating the immediate perceptual qualities there's you know you're supposed to like think about them and interpret them like ask what they mean um you know i mean i take it that actually something like duchamp's fountain right like with, with duchamp's fountain was the point of that to appreciate the immediate like the, the aesthetic qualities of the urinal well maybe that's one way you could look at it but um i don't think that's necessarily the most uh, illuminating way to look at it um okay so <clears throat> I think it's worth recalling what it is that motivates the mental frame view in the first place. Recall that the issue is this. So we have this tradition of attempting to, to define art, to say what it is that makes something art. And we say art is X. But then it turns out that however we fill out X, artists can present non-X objects as art and they can be successful. Right, like the art, and the artists are always going to win. <laughs> um, so now, as a result of that, we end up with this idea that okay, well, maybe anything can be art, and it's just a matter of how you mentally frame it. Um, so now the question is, well, what is what is it to mentally frame something as art? What is the right way of interacting with something so as to make it art? So on this mental frame view, the claim is that you make something art by engaging with it in some particular way, right? And now we have to fill out what that way is. Um, so you make something art by engaging with it in way Y. Okay, what's, how do we fill out Y? Um, well, the problem now is going to be that however we fill it out, I suspect that it will be possible for an artist to present something as art that they invite you to interpret in a way that is contrary to why. And again, there's going to be no particular reason to insist that they're unsuccessful. Um, of course, the, the artist, since we're in talking, you know, art is just a matter of a mental frame. The artist here can just be yourself. So you can just do this yourself, right? The idea is, well, okay, I make something art by mentally framing it as art. Okay, so I make something art by engaging with it in such and such a way. Well, why not make it art by engaging with it in a completely contrary way? Like, what's stopping you? What would be stopping you, exactly? So, however you fill out what it is to mentally frame something as art, why can't you make something art by doing something completely different to that? Um, so, you know, again, you know, if you say, well, you make something art by dispassionately appreciating its aesthetic properties, why not make it art by utilizing it for some purely pragmatic purpose? Um, why not make it art by uh, getting deeply emotionally immersed in it? Um, like, yeah, you know, you, uh, and actually notice that when you are, here's the other th the thing that's kind of interesting about this mental framing view is that whether you are dispassionately appreciating aesthetic properties, whether you're utilizing something for some pragmatic purpose, whether you are emotionally engaged, you're probably not making the sort of higher level judgment this thing is art right you're just you're just either you know looking at its aesthetic properties or you're feeling emotions or you're doing some pragmatic task um so yeah uh whatever whatever way we whatever whatever the mental framing is supposed to consist in why can't you just make something art by doing something opposite to that um so, um, you know, an another way to think about this is imagine, imagine that there are, there, are, there are two rocks, right? And uh, one of these rocks is presented as an art piece. 
so it's like a piece of found, I say this is like a piece of found art, right? So I'm like, this is art. The other is just a rock. Um, now, surely, you know, there's some sense in which it's kind of obvious that the framing here makes a difference. So, you know, when I, if, if you have like two rocks, if we're like walking outside and I point to a rock and I say, that is art. Um, obviously that's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference in terms of uh, how we think about that rock, how we interact with the rock. When, so when, when I point at a rock and say, that rock is art, it will prompt everybody to think of that rock differently. Um, but I think it's worth noting here that it doesn't follow from this that art really has any propositional content. So, you know, if somebody was to point at a rock and say, whoa, far out, man, that would prompt you to think of the rock differently. Uh, if somebody was to point at a rock and then while they're directing your attention to the rock, they hit you on the head with a stick, that might prompt you to think of the rock differently. Um, or indeed, if somebody points at a rock and says with total sincerity, that is not art. That's not art. Um, in just the kind of way that Willem de Kooning did with the breadcrumbs, right? Like, his whole point was the breadcrumbs aren't art. Uh, he's like, look, I take this frame, I put it there, they're still not art. Um, so by actively not framing them as art, that was a way of making them art. Uh, or at least, so here's, here's the point, right? You can take it that uh, actively not framing something as art makes it art. Um, and, you know, so here's, here's an idea of a, of a sort of art piece that might be interesting to think about in this context. I'll call it 344. So 344 is a composition I've just invented, and it consists of whatever sounds are occurring that are not being framed as art. Um, whatever it is that counts as framing something as art. So whatever the, the mental process is that's supposed to be involved in the mental framing, uh, 344 is, uh, is, is a piece, it's a comp composition, which consists of whatever sounds are not being framed in that way. So I guess maybe when you're just, you know, driving around and not thinking about art at all, uh, well, why, you know, I don't know, I mean, why isn't that a perfectly legitimate artwork? Um, if, if you accept that as an artwork, if you accept that, um, you know, that 344, if you, if you accept that you have performed three, 344 um, whenever you are just not thinking about art, then it looks like you can, you can make art by not framing something as art. Okay, so what I want to suggest is there is no particular way of experiencing something or interacting with something that constitutes the mental frame. For, for any account you propose of what the mental frame is supposed to involve, you can always be invited to make something art by engaging with it in a contrary way, and there won't be anything stopping you succeeding from that, succeeding at that. Um, so I don't think the mental frame view works. Um, I think that, I think that, my, so my view is, Art is just, the term art is just empty. Uh, this mental frame is empty. There is no such thing as art. Um, I actually think that um, in some sense, the more traditional uh, conservative approaches to art are actually better than the mental frame view. Just because when you think about the more traditional approaches to art, they do they are in some ways illuminating about various art traditions. So, you know, if somebody claims that art uh, is a matter of creating something in order to express emotions, well, you know, yeah, you can point to all sorts of artworks that this definition just fails to capture. Um, but that, that way of looking at art does tell you something. It does tell you something illuminating. It, it tells you, you know, so it tells you something to look for. It tells you something to, you know, to value. It tells you how to interact with uh, artworks. It kind of directs your attention to particular things because then you can kind of ask, well, you know, okay, so I have this 
art object. I know that art is a matter of expressing emotions. So what emotions is it expressing? How is it expressing those emotions, right? Like how, like how does this work? It gives you a way of interacting with that. Uh, the mental frame view just does nothing. Um, it just doesn't seem to be illuminating at all. Um, so uh, yeah, so in, in that sense, I think, you know, if the project is to figure out what art is, I think that the traditional approach, the, the more kind of conservative, restrictive view um, is, it at least has kind of collateral benefits. Uh, whereas this mental frame view, um, I think, does does nothing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, look, I actually think the mental frame view is very well motivated. It's just that the the very same thing that motivates the mental frame view, uh, namely the fact that there are that like artists can always just create something outside of any limits that are being proposed on art. That very same thing is what makes it the case that there is no way of specifying any content to the mental frame. Um, there's no way of specifying what this mental frame is. Um, so uh, what I would say is, yeah, uh, art is empty. Uh, there, there just is no art. Um, I actually also would say that, uh, just to go back to the breadcrumbs, um, I think John Cage would probably agree with me. Um, so, you know, the, the, bre the framing thing with the breadcrumbs is just... I, I think that for Cage, that's, that's one sort of step on a journey which ends with the dissolution of any distinction between art and life. Um, so, yes, uh, that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to talk about today. So, um, uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will leave it there, I think. Um, and uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.